Minister, good morning. Thank you for being with us. Oh, good morning. No problem at all. Good to talk to you. All right. Quite a lot of interest from people, but I, I want to go through firstly the announcement you made on Monday. A six mm. point or a six kind of principles of, of education under this coalition government. Can you, in general terms, tell us what those principles are, what you're driving at? Sure, those are the, the you know the six priority areas that you'll see work streams drop out of, and we are making an announcement today around one of those areas. Which Just one? We'll look at it in totality. Yeah, which one are you making an announcement today about? Oh, <laughs> that's uh, around the how you teach the so the pedagogy, the the uh, that, that sort of that area. So yep. you'll have to wait and see, but not long. It's not not, not okay. far off. Um, but the 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 key for us is obviously we all know the declining standards and the literacy and numeracy rates. And I guess when you look at this approach, it is a fundamental shift and a fixing of what I call the bones of education. So what we teach, the how we teach, uh, the assessment part, uh, and then the learning support and workforce. And the big overriding factor is how we use data to drive everything we do. I tell you the one thing when I came into this chair in December and I asked, what are the outcomes of all of the money we spend? The answer was, Minister, we don't know. Because we don't, we don't measure them. Collect data. No, we don't measure anything. So we spend more and more money on things that are uh, to try and fix problems, um, but we don't measure the outcomes. So we need to make sure we know what's working so we can divert resource into that and away from things that aren't working. But if you look at it in its totality, it really, really is a shift of what all the other countries have had to do over the last couple of decades, a shift back to a knowledge-rich curriculum and explicit teaching. Yeah, I, so I, I, I don't shift. quite understand how education systems got away from that because that would seem to always have been the whole point. Well, yes, it was. And we always used to have, I mean, a syllabus, I guess you'd call mm. it. We did have a syllabus, which was all the knowledge laid out and here's what you need to teach and when. We shifted away because the ideology changed and the ideas changed to actually, no, kids need, need, to, need to learn competencies, how to be future problem solvers, collaborative learners and critical thinkers. And so our in 2007, our uh, curriculum changed to be based on competencies rather than knowledge and we stripped all knowledge out so rather than a good balance which is ideal uh, stripped out knowledge it is a very thin high level vague document and so what that has meant is the curriculum has been devolved down to schools and since then we've had this idea of local curriculum. and when you've got well, local stuff you cannot put a a ruler across everything you can't get a national standard you don't really know what's going on do you if everyone's off doing their own thing well, that's right. There's no no national consistency, and you know, you need curriculum experts to to write curriculum mm. because we've devolved it down to the local level. Some schools do an excellent job of creating a local curriculum. Look, and others just don't have the resource, and it's very time intensive on our teachers. And if we want to support them to remain in the job, you know, we need to give them the tools to get on with the thing that they do best, which is contextualising that to the kids in front of them. The magic that they bring to making the lessons exciting and vibrant—that's yeah. what they do. So we want to support them with this knowledge-rich curriculum. We've been looking around the world at what everyone else does and we've got people writing it as we speak. And then the next part, of course, is how you teach it. And there will be a shift away from uh, a, a more of a balance. It's not a complete, sh you know, sh closing the door to, but it is a shift back towards explicit, direct instruction by the teacher imparting knowledge rather than, you know... And, and an old terminology, chalk everything. and talk, right? Well, look a little bit, but I mean, we yeah. are in a, you know, a new modern world and, and it looks very different these days. I mean, structure looks... And if I was going to update chalk and talk, reels, not feels, maybe. <laughs> maybe. That might catch on. I'll see how it goes today in my uh, stand-up. All right. Look, one policy that... And though I, I think your political opponents um, poo-pooed it early on, um, we've actually been talking about it here on the platform for a couple of years, um, the... Well, smartphone ban, and, and I'm not going to say it's a ban, the restrictions on smartphone use by students during school hours, that's what it actually is. That actually mm. seems to have gone down bloody well. It was one of those policies I was most worried about, not because I didn't believe in it, because we read a lot of research and there's more come out since, but because I thought the pushback would be a lot more. Uh, and actually, I've been so overwhelmed at the support from principals who say they wish they'd done it five years ago, from from teachers who say that, that it's that the learning environment has drastically improved and kids are taking the books out of libraries more often and talking to each other during lunchtimes and parents love it because 
as a parent, trying to keep your kids advice is, you know, it's very difficult. But the thing that has surprised me the most is the comments from the kids themselves. And yeah, it's a bit bumpy early on while they're, you know, breaking the addiction. Mm. <laughs> but actually, they're now starting to say, and there was one comment in the media I was just reading the other day about a girl from, I think it was from behind, saying it is a weight off our shoulders um, not having to, you know, constantly check social media messages and that there's more time to interact. And so many kids are saying we're talking to each other more and actually they're feeling free. So that response has been overwhelming. There is a, you know, it looks a little bit bumpy at the moment because term two, a lot of schools are, are, are implementing it this term rather than last. So you're getting, you know, yeah. t- students who are <laughs> having to do it for the first time. But look, I'm really confident that it's going to go well. And the, the lo- latest research now out of Britain and uh, Norway is just incredible, uh, especially for girls, for their mental health and low decile schools. That is where we're going to see some of the big gains, but also in uh, achievement as well. Good so I'm stuff. very positive about it. Hey, look, one thing, and no one who's covered education or news or been a journalist in New Zealand would deny this. You do have a problem, I, I would say, as a centre-right Minister of Education, and that many people who teach and are in our education system, I'm going to be blunt about it, are card-carrying lefties. And let's just take an example recently. Was it um, Albany College where the principal came out against the cell phone ban and was basically super, super political? We've had, um, you know, cabinet colleagues of yours going to schools and being spat at. And we have one news on, you know, the school climate strike, some girl saying David Seymour was a dick. It looks to a lot of people from the outside, like a lot of schools, secondary schools in particular, are being run by people who are tribal lefties. And and I think it makes people really angry, Minister, that our kids are being subjected to political bias and political influence when they should just be learning. Well, that might be the view of some people. Look, I know the, the um, principle... Are you of, saying there are... Hang, well. on, well, hang on, you say that no, might be no, the hold view. On. Are you saying there answer. are not people let me, let me running schools sure. who are politically active? Look, everybody in this country has a political view. The one thing I know about teachers and principals is that they care desperately about their kids. And I know Claire Amos, who's the principal of uh, Albany Senior in my electorate. She's a wonderful woman. I think she's probably not uh, not a national voter, but who knows? I haven't asked her. However, I know her, and I know she cares about her kids, and she's trying to do the right thing. Um, we, but however, it is a regulation. It is the law. Aero will have to go and visit and say, look, here's the latest data and research and evidence, and we're going to work with you to make sure that this is implemented. So it, it is, you know, it's unfortunate that there are a handful of schools. But look, I don't doubt their passion. That they're trying to do the right thing for their kids. Look, it's my job. I bring them all along with me. And if I haven't done that, then that's on me. All right. Look, the other issue that I am duty-bound because my audience uh, or our listeners, our family at the platform, want to know the question to RSE, sex education, gender education in our school system. And uh, from what I can understand, the continued involvement of gay and transgender lobbyists in the delivery of of those uh, services within our school system. Um. Minister, have you got a position on where we're at with that and what changes are coming? Well, it is a coalition agreement to remove the relationship and sexuality guidelines and replace them. And remember, they're not the curriculum, and this is where it gets a little bit...